And we are live. Welcome, Mr. Ann Thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am so excited to present to you journalist turned author Kalia Simon live from Cambridge, Massachusetts on the eve of her book publication date tomorrow. Kalia Simon, author of Hold Me Down. Kalia, welcome to Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Tell us about this show. Thanks so much for having me, Sarah. And I'm thrilled to tell you about Hold Me Down. Uh, Hold Me Down uh, draws on my history as a rock critic because its protagonist, Gal Raver, was a rock star uh, for a hot minute, like 20 years ago. And now, 20 years later, she's barely survived it, but she ends up back in town to play a memorial. And when she sees uh, someone from her past and that person ends up dead and a dear friend is uh, it, implicated in the murder, she knows she has to dig back into that past, that past that almost killed her to save her friend and really to understand what happened. Oh, whoa. Well, very, very cool to hear the, uh, the, the, the 411 on hold me down. And I cannot wait to get into all of the details, including your own history as a rock critic. What? So cool. But first, I just want to welcome everyone who is watching with us. Welcome, welcome, welcome. If you've all, if you've been here before, you know the drill. And if you're new, oh, we're so happy to have you you here's the drill every monday for hashtag mystery monday because you know mondays can be murder i give you my hand-picked featured authors and you get to ask them anything so ask clea about her days as a rock journalist a rock critic ask her day about her days as a journalist for the boston globe ask her about her cozies featuring cats in cambridge i need to know more ask her about the process of writing hold me down ask her about this character gal we've got a lot to talk about and i want to get into every single part of it so get the questions going in the comments wherever you're watching from youtube and facebook get them going in the comments i'll get them right over to Clea. Welcome, Glenn. Welcome, La Foster. Welcome, Madeline. Welcome, everybody. So great to have you here with us tonight. Clea, welcome, Faye. Nice to see you. Um, Clea, I'm going to kick off with a question. Well, actually, let's start with your fabulous reviews. Lisa Unger, who was just on the show a few weeks ago, October Fourth for her pre-launch invitation, uh, her pre-launch event, um, raves. This book is provocative, moving, and suspenseful. Not to be missed. Don't miss it, she says. So let's stop there. Pro let's start there. Provocative, moving, and suspenseful. How did you make a book? How did it, from a craft perspective that is provocative, moving, and suspenseful? Give us the four one one. Well, I don't want to give too much away, Sarah, but I will say I deal with some hot button issues, you know, in the things that we're dealing with in the Me Too issue, uh, Me Too era with uh, PTSD and sexual assault and really how, how the entertainment industry, well, as we've seen with Britney Spears, how the entertainment industry monetizes dysfunction in women. And, you know, Gal survived all that, but she survived it only barely. So there's there's drugs, there's sex, there's rock and roll. It all goes together. Drug, sex, and rock and roll. Ooh la la. Let's talk about the Britney thing. So I have been riveted um, by the idea that a woman in 2021 can be held captive by this archaic conservatorship in front of our very eyes, having amassed a fortune of $60 million, released all these albums, be doing, you know, 10 shows a week, six days a uh, you know, six days a week or whatever it was in Las Vegas, and yet not be able to buy a pack of gum without her dad's permission. I mean, it was so bizarre. Finally, she is free. Um, as a journalist and as a rock critic, were you watching this with special interest? What were your thoughts? Well, yes, of course. I, I mean, Gal had already been created by them and written by them, but I felt like I was watching it play out again. Because with Britney, you know, uh, granted, maybe she had some issues. I'd say she certainly did. But at the same time, every time she did something a little crazy, they made more money. It made the headlines. So, you know, maybe I am seeing that, I, and I know this from my contacts in the industry, I know this from my research, the industry really pushes women to the edge. They want you to be a little crazy. They want you to be a little wild. That sells product. But then, you know, when they do, as with Britney, they found they could control her. So, oh my God, that poor girl, poor woman. What sort of uh, rock stars, rockers did you review and interview in your days as a rock critic, Clea? Uh, well, I think I spoke to everybody and I, I, I don't want to give away too much 
about the book partly because some women who had you know faced the demons of uh you know the drugs the abuse the time on the road really bared their souls to me for this book but yeah, everybody from Chrissy Hine to Johnny Rotten, uh, the psychedelic furs, uh, you know, Paul McCartney, you name it. Um, I've spoken to everybody. And wow. most of the time they're, you know, really lovely people and they just they just want to talk about their art. You yourself are a musician, Kalia. What's your uh, what's your what's your instrument of choice? Tell us about that. Well, I, th th it's a stretch to call me still a musician. I haven't <laughs> played in bands in years, uh, but I played bass, that both electric bass and acoustic bass. Why the bass? Well, I started playing acoustic bass when I was in grade school because I was the tallest kid in the class. <laughs> but also, um, it just felt right. There's something about, and I, I use this for gal. There's just something about that that rhythm and those low notes, and they thrum through you. And you know, and when you're in a band, you're the bass. You're the you're the heartbeat. You're the one who makes everything happen. So I did not know that. Okay, so you liked you liked to be the heartbeat then. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. I I I'm here for it. Uh, Clea, the incredible Caroline Levitt, also loved this book. Um, she she gave you another rave review. Um, has there been a, a review in particular where you like, yes, I am seen. I this person gets me, or you just put it out there and think, let's see how this resonates. Um, there, there, luckily, there have been several. I'm, I'm, I'm honored and blessed that writers who I admire, like Caroline Levitt, like Lisa Unger, like Meg Gardner, like Joanne Schaffhausen, all these people have just really, they, they got it. They got the woman inside the story. Um, yeah. So those have been wonderful. But I've also gotten some really great reviews from other critics and people in the rock and roll world um, that, that talk about the setting and, you know, say that, not many people really write about the rock world. They don't get it. They don't get the the feeling of it. They don't get the rush of performing on stage. And they don't get the exhaustion and, you know, the smells. <laughs> what it's like to be in a van for a week. Oh, my God. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Caroline uh, Levitt, New York Times bestselling author, raved. This book is devastatingly powerful. It hits you like a punch to the heart. Um, wow, that is a that is a that is a powerful review. Congratulations on that. Because I think it's hard to write about big topics in a way that doesn't seem overblown or um, you know, oversaturated or, 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 or too much it, when something is itself too big, almost to fit on the page. It's, it's, it's extra challenging. I find as a writer, um, talk, talk us through that. Uh, well, th thank you. And, and I think for me, what's key, and, and this is for me as a reader as well. And again, this is one of the reasons I love Caroline Levitt's book so much is that the, the issues that you're dealing with every, everyone wants to deal with an issue, but mm -hmm. it has to come from the character. And and Gal is a survivor. Uh, mm. She she lives this, so it's not it's not something that's just pasted on. This is something that's real to her, and that's why I like to think that even for people who who didn't live through what she lived through or even experienced what I experienced, we'll be able to connect with her because mm. this is something you know, women, men too, but women in particular, we've we live through this, we go through this, we know what it's like to be you know to have our sexuality manipulated and to have it you know pushed pushed out in ways we don't necessarily want. We know what it's like to feel uh, like we're a commodity. Mm -hmm. um, and and it's, it's hard, it's hard as anything to break through that and to find yourself and to find an authentic self uh, inside all that. So I, I like to think that that's what Caroline was connecting to. Uh, just the, the, um, the, the way that gal, the way that we all have to push through this, we have to find a way to survive and define ourselves beyond how a world might see us. Oh, I love that. I love that. Now, Clea, how did you relate to Gal? First of all, how long did it take you to create Gal, to create this book? Wow. Well, uh, Gal and Hold Me Down have been in the works for several years now. And and mm -hmm. yes, so I've been writing other books in the interim, which sort of was a nice thing because I got to put uh, Hold Me Down aside and work on some of the other books. But this has been in the works for a while now because what Gal and I share, and I don't want to give any spoilers, but mm -hmm. Gal and I share certain traumatic experiences, which a lot of women share. And mm -hmm. working through that for me personally um, allowed me to work through it with Gal and vice versa. Sometimes I'd write something for Gal and I'd think, this isn't quite right. That's not how someone would react. And working through how Gal 
survived, how how Gal's personality, how her whole life trajectory would change because of these events, and because of her own reactions, helped me understand how how I reacted and why I reacted the way I did. And mm -hmm. and really, it was a it turned something from from trauma to a discovery of self exploration that was uh, really quite fulfilling and, and wonderful. Mm. Was it hard to do that work to go into that to dig into that pain? Uh, Sarah, you know it was. But if you yeah. don't do the work, you don't um, you don't get through it. The only way out is through. So you have mm -hmm. to dive in. You have to deal mm -hmm. with it. You know, otherwise otherwise it's always controlling you. Mm. I love that. The only way out is in. Um, do you feel more healed now that you have written this book or do you feel does it make you feel more vulnerable to put it out tomorrow um well i feel a little vulnerable just because it's my baby going out there in the world <laughs> but i do feel more healed i feel tougher i feel like maybe i've mm. i've i've summoned my inner gal raver i feel like if anyone pushes back on me i can just go you know the hell with you i you know i i've survived more than you can give me now yeah, exactly. You just blast them backward with your bass, like that scene in um, in Back to the Future. You just turn it way up and just the, the, the volume will just propel them apart. Yes, yes. Oh my goodness. Um, let you reference you reference the uh, rave review from um, Meg Gardner. Another one, Olene Cogdell said Simon perceptively illustrates the sacrifices one makes for art. Simon's tour of the Boston music scene will make readers wish hold me down included a link to iTunes. So two parts. <laughs> <laughs> so two parts that I want to address this. Let's start with the iTunes link. What songs do you think an artist would best accompany this book? What should we when we have our cheese platter and wine afterward or we get ready to sell with the book? What soundtrack best would accompany, accompany this book, Clea? Well, uh, you and I have talked about this a little bit before, and I think really what comes to mind now is the pretenders. You know, Chrissy Hind with her tough gal stance. Man, that would be so great. Otherwise, I'd go for bands that yeah, I came up listening to, like L7 or Slater Kinney uh, or Bikini Kill. Some of those women-fronted bands that were tough and just did not take anything that they didn't want to. They just pushed it back at you. But I think uh, Chrissy Hine with that white leather jacket on the cover of the first Pretenders album, that's that's what we want to be listening to right now. Okay, awesome. Catherine is saying, I'm a little late. No worries, Catherine, you're right on time. She says, apologies if this has already been answered. What prompted your decision to move to darker crime fiction? I'm excited about it. So Ka uh, Catherine, first of all, welcome. So great to have you as always. Second of all, for those who don't know, Clea has previously written Cozies, which uh, feature her cats, which are, Cozies are, are almost a safer world where, you, where it's not so tense. So let's talk about moving from that from that into this into the world of this as Catherine is bringing up Clea give us the skinny uh well it's true I've usually done cozies I've done one other rock world book world enough uh but basically it's been like my witch cats of Cambridge cozies like a, a cat on the case or a spell of murder um and it's, it's just I think it's just a different part of my personality and that mm. the cozies they are a safer space they're they're nice they're serious i love going back to them it's like visiting with an old friend and being someplace where you know that you're welcomed and you know that all will turn out right in the end and now and hold me down i am a firm believer that in crime fiction you have to have a resolution i'm not going to leave anything okay. un, un understood but justice and understanding what's going on isn't always exactly a happy ending the cozies you're going to get a happy ending hold me down it's a little bit more ambiguous, um, but mm. and I just this book. I think because I was dealing with in part with my own trauma, this book just sort of wanted to be written. Now I expect to go back to the cozies. I love the cozies. They're they're, they're my safe space. Um, but yeah, every now and then I I want to go in the deep end. Ooh, well, welcome to the deep end, Clea. Uh, I love that. I love that. Jason Pinter chiming in. Hey, Jason. Jason, of course, has been on the show twice for his fabulous books. Um, Stranger at the Door was most recent. Um, uh, so I will pop the link into the comments there. Jason, great to have you as always. Um, Catherine saying, I agree. Great description of cozies. Um so, so you do see yourself going back uh, next book, or are you going to do a few more in this realm and the rocker and the in the drug, sex, and rock and roll realm, and then back to the cozies? Or when when are we gonna? When can we? What can we expect expect to see from you next? Um, okay. I think I might need a break if I can evoke <laughs> uh, if I can uh, invoke a, a, another fantastic writer, Katrina McPherson. Uh, okay. She goes back and forth between her cozies, 
which are often historical um, and and these deeper, darker books. And that to me sounds like the, the way to mental health is the cozies are, they really are, they're my safe place. They're, they're the world set right. And, you know, mm. spending time with cats, what's, you know, what's better than that? But at the same time, yeah, I, I, I wanna go into the deep end again. Ooh, so, okay, so you're gonna be, so we can expect to see you both in the cozy world and the deep end. Um, and 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 great that your publisher is letting you explore these different genres. Cause sometimes I think, Thank you, you know, you get pressure to, to, to just do what you do well and to keep repeating that. Um, but you have felt empowered to, to explore other options then. It's been very nice to have a supportive publisher. And I think this is one of the great things about a smaller publisher is, is I feel like I'm trusted as a writer. Ooh, tell us about that. How do you feel trusted and how has that impacted your writing? Um, I, I feel like I can talk to my publisher and just say, this is what I'm working on now. And, and this is important to me. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and that that's nice, you know, and I, I don't want to lose either audience. I'm a little worried about how some of the cozy people will think about this book, but, um, you know, I'll, I'll be back. And I, I think that people can tell the difference. I think they can tell their different books and they can choose what to read. Yeah, exactly. And it'll be, I'm curious about that because it seems like the world of cozies, they know what they like and they, they stick to it. So it'll be interesting to see whether, you know, they come with you or whether you have just two really different audiences or how this is going to go, Clea, yeah, because there's also a, yeah. obviously a big market for, um, you know, psychological thrillers and, 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 and there's also a big market for cozy. So very curious to see how, how that goes. Very exciting out tomorrow, you guys. So I want to, um, another, oh my gosh, I can't, I cannot, uh, I cannot and not include this review from library, library journal, a mystery that explores character motivations for fans of Alexander McCall Smith and Janet Ivanovich. <laughs> oh my goodness. Congratulations on that rave review, Clea. Thank so you. Isn't it fun to, to be, to have both the talk about the cozy and the, and, and the non cozy that just across that spectrum. Yes. Well, like we were talking about with issues, if you're going to have issues in your in your book, it has to come out of the character. So as much mm -hmm. as Gal is trying to save her friend by solving the murder, um, she's also trying to figure out figure out herself. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about. Uh, let okay, I have questions, but I want to get to Catherine's question too because I love this. What is your writing process? So, Clea, can you zoom in and tell us? Do you rise with the sun, make a blissful cup of coffee, float to your desk, and the words pour forth with effortless grace? Or are you, you know, hemming, weighing it, just clawing your way through a desert of misery, just day drinking through the process? I mean, what what's it look like? Let's get specific. Somewhere in between, I'd say. Um, <laughs> I certainly do not rise with the sun. I mean, didn't the rock and roll give you a hint? I'm, I'm, you know, I'm much more likely to be. I'm more likely to see dawn from the other side still. So <laughs> I'm, I am very much a night person, uh, but I, I do. And I am, you know, I assume that your people are familiar with the term pantser versus plotter. Um, I am very much still a, a pantser and that it, it just comes as I, I, um, yeah, I think E.L. Doctorow d referred to it as writing in the headlights. You only see as far ahead as your headlights are. You're not sure the entire book. Yes. So that's what I'm like. So for me, it's, Monday through Friday, and usually I don't settle down to do my writing until late in the day. But when I sit down to do my writing, how late? I usually write four-ish to nine-ish or so. Okay, for and one moment I thought you meant 4 a.m. tonight. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. No, okay. no, no. The only time I see 4 a.m. is if I've stayed up too late. <laughs> <laughs> um, but other than that, I what I, I do is I um I subscribe to the word count. Um, I, I have a, a daily word count that I have to hit and I tell myself that I can, I can write badly and that it's okay to write badly as the great pub rocker, Nick Lowe said, bash it out now, tart it up later. So I just, I will hit my word count by any means necessary, knowing full well that, you know, when that draft is done, I might throw out three quarters of it and start over. But if you just keep writing, if you trust the process, uh, you end up with a story. It's, it's like, um, you know, the, the story of an optimist, this, I always think of this as myself, the little girl who sees a big pile of horse manure and she dives in and someone says, why are you diving into that big pile of horse crap? And she says, this much horse crap, there's gotta be a pony in there somewhere. <laughs> so that's how I often feel with my first drafts. I'll have, you know, a hundred thousand words and I'll go, well, you know, there's gotta be a pony in there somewhere. Okay. Okay. What if there's not a pony? Do you ever find yourself just under a big pile of horse crap and then you've got to dig your way out or you, or you always find your pony? Well, the pony might be pretty small and might need a lot of work, but you know, even if, even if you come out with like one paragraph, you go, this is good. <laughs> 
<laughs> True oh my story. Um, my 2017 book, World Enough, which is my other rock book, I started. I wrote. I started that one 20 years ago, and I rewrote that. And I rewrote that. And I rewrote that. I put it away for you know 10 years, whatever. Um, and when I went back to it, I think I saved the first 18 pages. That's it. Out of like the many? first scene. Oh, hundreds. Oh my God. Okay. I was just going to ask you, so Clea, as a journalist, uh, as a rock critic, as a journalist, I was going to say, are you a very tight writer? Or are you like, I have 500 words and every word's going to count? Or are you a more of a bloated writer? You got to cut it down. I myself am bloated. What about you? Well, when I'm doing the journalism, I write to word count. I mean, I was trained. It's like I write to deadline and I write to word count. You want 500 words, or as we used to call them, column inches, boom, I will get you 499. If it's 501, there'll be something you can cut. Okay. Um, but other than that, often when I'm writing, um, I actually, I sort of underwrite and the way okay. I think of it is, is I've left too much of the story in my head. You know, I'll read it through. I'll go, well, that's kind of flat. And it's like, oh yeah, all that description, everything I saw, everything I heard, everything I tasted, it's still there in my head, but I didn't write it on the page. <laughs> so yeah. So yeah, my first draft is almost more like a really, really big outline. Okay. 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 Good to know. Good to know. Um, Melissa, welcome. Patricia, welcome. Rebecca, great to see you. Welcome. Um, so I just want to remind everybody that this book isn't even out yet. This is an exclusive pre-launch event with Clea Simon, and you can get your copy, order it tonight, and it will ship out tomorrow when the book comes out. So grab your book from this independent, woman-owned, mystery-dedicated bookstore, Murder by the Book. The link is in the comments. I'm popping it up right now. Um, so there you go. Um, Clea, one more thing I want to talk about is the, um, is, is, is the book blog of the Bristol Public Library I said this is as much a character study as it is a mystery. Simon's best book to date. Very cool. Um, what do you think they meant by, first of all, did you mean to write it as such as a character study? And what do you think they meant by that? Um, I didn't mean to write it as a character study, but I think that the best mysteries, the best plots come out of characters. They're not mm. something superimposed. It's, it's, these are the people. This is how they interact. This okay. is how things happen. Um, and I'm, I'm thrilled that she saw it that way because I think the reason, well, the reason I read books is for the characters. I mean, mm. when you look back, you might remember something about the plot, but what you really remember are those people that you wanted to spend time with, right? That's so, so true. So let's talk about Gal's character. Um, she is... Uh, a, a person, a human who is very, uh, who cares very deeply about her friends, yet as a flawed human, uh, has hurt those friends. Let's talk about her as a complex character. Well, she is in some ways the ultimate unreliable narrator because, yes, yeah, she is, she's a survivor. But mm -hmm. to be a survivor, that means you had to have some damage first. Mm -hmm. And yes, her driving force really is her loyalty to her friends. And and another theme in the book is really the, the choices that women make between friends and family, uh, you know, having children, not having children, the relationships we choose. And Gal's made her choices and she has to live with them. But she also has to live with the reality that she's beginning to realize that in some ways she hurt her friends. And those are the people, she, she's hurt the people she's loved most. Mm -hmm. um, and part of of coming to terms with what's happened to her, part of coming to terms even with understanding the mystery mm. is is learning what happened and how how she might have hurt people. Was it hard for you to write a complex character, especially a complex female character, when um, culturally we're making progress, but we're still quick to cast stones at female characters, especially complex ones? Were you worried about making her likable? Were you worried? Did you not care? I know one of your songs that you posted on your Instagram is, um, I don't care about my bad reputation. Joan, <laughs> Joan Jett, I don't give a <laughs> about my reputation. Um, do you care about Gal's reputation? Were you trying, did you feel protective of her? Or are you just like, I got to put her out there and see what how it goes? What well, these are that? these are questions I didn't actually start to think about until recently, because to me, I once I was in this book, mm -hmm. I I love Gal. And I, you know, I understand her. And and for me, what was what I was focused on was understanding her better. How would she react here? Why is she doing this? You know, and, and how can I use that? Um, that to me is is that was sort of to the forefront. Now I'm wondering, gee, will people will people love her as I love her? And I hope they do. And and I hope that they also see how her reactions to the outside world may not always be the truth. You know, she's 
she's seeing things through some cracked glass at times. But we all are, right? We all see things through our own lived experiences, our own biases, conscious and unconscious. How do you do that and yet get people to trust this character that you want them to care about, want, want them to trust? Well, I, you, I think- Or maybe you're trying, yeah. are, were you intending to sort of make that is, that, is that questionability part of your secret plan? <laughs> oh, I wish. Uh, <laughs> well, she just, she just was real to me. And I think that we're all like this. And what I was hoping to do and what, you know, this is this is the work of revision and revision and revision is to, to use um, the world around her, sort of the reflections to show what, what you know, objective reality is, if there is such a thing. I mean, for example, Gal's songs, she's, she's, they are, they're almost their own character. She was the songwriter for the band. Her, her songs, including Hold Me Down, uh, were the band's big hits. And those songs are almost external characters. So you have Gal looking back on the songs when she wrote them. Like when she wrote them, she was really sort of uptight and scared. Um, and now, you know, when she looks back on a song, she goes, oh, that was so fussy. I can skim over this part. Um, and at the same time, you have other people reacting to the songs, how the, the suits at the record labels uh, reacted to them, how the fans reacted to them, how her own bandmates reacted to them. So they're a way of, of checking to see sort of what's real. And, and, and then you can sort of, you'll get a sense of when she reacts to say men, she always sees men as coming on to her. Gee, is that, is that the truth? I mean, she is a rock star, was a rock star, but she's also a woman of a certain age. So maybe there's something else going on here. So I, I think I just felt like if I could get into her and I could understand her and present her, then people would, you know, they, they'd see themselves as flawed human beings in her. And they'd also figure out maybe even before Gal, what's real and what's not. Mm, very interesting. Uh, welcome, Ricky. Welcome, Ward. Welcome, Beverly. Great to have you here. Um, uh, oh, good question here. Did you do any research for the book? So you referenced interviewing a few. Uh, tell us, tell us the full scale of your research. So you've been well, thinking about this book for a couple of years. How did you? How did you research? Where did you start? And how? What did it look like? Well, for me, a lot of it was revisiting uh, a lot of things that I already knew about, and mm -hmm. I, I'm lucky enough to have some friends who've uh, who've who've been much better musicians than I have and have gone on to various levels of fame and fortune. And I've had some really candid conversations with them. Like one woman who was telling me about how um, at one point uh, she had such a bad Coke addiction, she weighed 87 pounds and they sent her off to detox. Um, another woman, you know, I've heard lots of stories like that. But then also sometimes there was just, there were these throwaway lines. Like one woman I know who sang in a local band just mentioned off the top of her head that people don't realize how much you can see from on stage. You know, they think all those bright lights, they're not seeing everything. But the truth is when you're up on stage, especially if it's an elevated stage, you can see back to the dark corners of the hall. And, you know, that came up when I was writing one of the scenes where Gal is performing and I thought that was an interesting thing. And then as I was writing it, I realized, well, Gal can see back to the dark corners of the hall, but can she trust what she's seeing? Is she seeing what's real? I mean, you know, something you see in the dark and a flash of light, you see, you know, the, the, the strobes going maybe. Is that really what's happening? Is that a flashback? Is that a memory? Or, or is it real? Because these are common occurrences. You see, you know, drunk people doing crazy stuff. Um, so just talking to people, basically, uh, revisiting some of my own notes, listening to a lot of the music, music I used to play and music I used to listen to just to get the emotional thrust of those songs, just to, to feel what it's like, like picking up that bass again and realizing, wow, I'd forgotten how heavy it is. I have, a, you know, a solid body Gibson and it, it's, it's a solid instrument. It's, it's a real thing. It's, it's an extension of yourself when you're on stage. And that's, mm -hmm. that's exciting. That is exciting. That is exciting. Do you still play, Clea? No, I should. <laughs> I when I picked it up, you know, I was like, "Wow, I I miss this." It's like an old friend, you know. I I, I wouldn't be starting from zero if I played again, but I haven't played in a while. My chops are very rusty. Um, I love that you were thinking about how much, you know, what does it feel like in your hand? How much does it weigh? What are the smells? All of these, all yeah. of these things. Um, you also said that, uh, Catherine, thank you for the great question. I loved, I love that. Um, you've referenced this world of sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Why is the rock and roll world so full of sex and drugs? Well, it is a world of, um, of rejecting the status quo, of rebellion, of finding your own thing. It's DIY. It's also set at it happens at night it happens at night in clubs filled with with alcohol it, it's it's um rock rock deals a lot with authenticity 
unlike you know, it, it's in folk music, for example, it, if you if you play something that's 200 years old, um, that's that's a great thing. With rock, especially like you know, since the Beatles, since Dylan, you're supposed to be playing your own music. You're supposed to be drawing something out of yourself, something real, and presenting it, and and really presenting something that maybe you couldn't articulate in any other way. And that's hard to do. I mean, you know, you're tearing your guts out every night and and presenting it to strangers strangers who are just out for a good time maybe you're just out to to drink so so yeah so and to get up on stage especially gal has stage fright and that's something that i i know about so that's something i drew from my own experience it's a little easier to get up and spill your guts and you know scream into a mic when you've had a drink or two or you know maybe you're touring and you do a, a toot to stay awake it it all just sort of it, it becomes its own thing Wait, i don't what's a toot i don't know what that is <laughs> A little bit of cocaine just to wake you up so you can perform. How's that? Okay, okay, okay. I'm a straight edge nerd, Clea. You gotta, you gotta break it down for me. You're speaking a language. I yes, am I these days? But, <laughs> but back in the day. <laughs> oh my goodness! Welcome, Mark. So great to have you here. Hey, Beverly. Thanks for coming. Nice to see you as well. Um, Clea, what is one thing that? So, what is one thing you want people to to feel? to learn, to question, to experience? What do you want people to walk away from this book with? Wow, that's a great question, Sarah. Thanks so much. I, th I think I would go back with the one thing that I want people to, to feel and to walk away with um, mm -hmm. is what Gal is walking away with. It's, it's, it's this understanding that we're all carrying around a certain amount of damage, that we're all survivors in some way or another. And that to see clearly going forward and to have honest relationships, we have to understand how that's affected us. And we have to accept that, you know, perhaps we're not who we thought we were. Mm. Right, which brings up a whole other uh, bunch of questions because if you are up on that stage and seeing yourself through the stage lights, through, seeing yourself through reviews, through, through the adulation of the fans, through other people's lived experiences, um, through a two or two. I mean, who knows what, you know, that, that raises a whole bunch of, of questions. I mean, not just for musicians, but for all of us, who are we, who we perceive ourselves to be or who others perceive us to be or some combination of, you know, are we our best selves, the selves that we would present on stage or, or are we our secret selves that, that we hide from the rest of the world? So a lot of, a lot of good questions there. Um, Clea, how long did it take you to write this book? Well, um, I, I, I went into it and back to it, back, you know, it went in and out of it for, for several years, really. So, um, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, I'd say, I'd say three or four years. Was it because you were, you needed to take the break and write a cozy or you just got distracted or, or, or you really needed that time to let it marinate? Was it intentional or? Yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, well, I did. I did have other books. I had other projects yeah. I had to write, and I had my cozies, which I love. But I did find that every time I, I went away from it, I came back to it with new insight. Mm -hmm. um, and and you know, also maybe I needed to do some more work on myself as well. Mm -hmm. And so all that time played into the book. And I, I like to think it's like um, you know, like if you're simmering something on the stove. I like to think it became it became richer with time. Oh, I love that. Now, most importantly, how did your cat Musetta <laughs> contribute to this book? Well, I'm I'm afraid that we're now on to Thisbe, um, who is probably somewhere around me right now. Um, mm -hmm. And um, she contributes by, uh, she keeps me off my phone because she attacks <laughs> my cell phone. So that keeps me focused on my computer screen, which is a, a better way to, uh, <laughs> and, you know, and she's a calming influence. I mean, with my witch cat books, she's an inspiration in millions of ways. I mean, with the witch cat books, I realized that I had a cat who could walk through walls because if, if you're a cat owner, you know that sometimes your cat just isn't there. And then suddenly <laughs> your cat's there. What happens? So I, th I think the cat walked through walls. So oh she's very much an influence there. But with, with Hold Me Down, she was, I guess you could say she grounded me. You know, she was, she was when I had written a hard scene or Gal had been through something particularly tough, it was really nice to be able to stroke her for. Oh, I love that. I love that. As someone who uh, is a the proud mother of a cat-sized dog, my 13-pound payload, there is nothing more comforting than holding that little warm fluff and, and, and stroking their fur. Um, Y'all, I want to remind you that this book ain't even out yet. It's coming out tomorrow. So grab your copy tonight. Click the link. I plopped it into the comments on all of the platform. Grab your copy. Support a woman-owned independent bookstore. 
Clea Simon, what a delight to host you. Thank you for the inside scoop on Hold Me Down <laughs> out tomorrow, everybody. Um, and to continue the conversation, join my face group, Facebook group, Mystery and Thriller Mavens. Read the book and let us know what you think. We'll see you over there. Clea, congratulations. Happy Pub Day tomorrow. And uh, when your next book is out, come back and find us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you all of you who contributed your questions. It's lovely to meet you all. Yay. Have a great night, everybody. I'll see you next week for hashtag Mystery Monday with Tamarin Hall. Have a great night.